We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about concierge uh, practice of medicine. Uh, our first speaker is uh, no stranger to AAPS, as he's uh, certainly been an AAPS member for some time, and he's uh, talked to us before about uh, concierge uh, medicine. Uh, Dr. Legrelius is a board-certified uh, specialist in family medicine and geriatric medicine. Uh, most of us have come to associate him with uh, INDOC, of course, and he's talked to us about that before. He's also associated uh, with something called SIMPTI, which is the uh, board of the Society for Innovative Medical Practice Design. No board, just the <laughs> correct. So without taking up any further of his time, uh, Dr. Legrelius. Thank you. Uh, and with me next up is uh, Steve Canope, who's a concierge doc in Tucson, Arizona, and, and you'll be getting a chance to talk to him. There was supposed to be a third speaker up here, Marcy Zwelling, who's a concierge physician in Los Alamitos near Long Beach and is currently running for CMA president in California. She's an incredible person. And she was going to talk about her concierge practice. And I was going to talk about SIMPTI. And Steve is going to talk about politics and his book and other issues. He just got back from Washington, DC, where he learned we're in big trouble. You'll hear more later. Um, but since Marcy uh, was in Long Beach waiting for a plane that was disabled at noon and wasn't going to take off till 3.30, she didn't get here, so she's not here, sadly. So what I decided to do was quickly go through a presentation I wrote for another purpose on my concierge practice, just to show you some slides on that real quickly for about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to talk about SIMPTI for about 15 minutes, and I'm going to give Steve about 30 minutes to talk to uh, about his subjects. This is Big Bear. I have a cabinet Big Bear. Um, um, concierge medicine is an innovative practice idea whose time has come. Um, this is the uh, website uh, that I, uh, the, the front page of the website. And if you had time, you could read this. Uh, it basically describes what a concierge practice is all about. Um, patients are seen. Uh, 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 immediately when they're sick, they have 30 visit, visit, minute visits, there's no waiting. Uh, the, the, our waiting room is, an, is a non-waiting room. Um, patients have our cell phone numbers and our um, home phone numbers and our pager numbers and can reach us 24-7 or are invited to do so. Um, I think everybody's care and primary care should be that way and we now have data showing that when primary care is delivered that way, um, technical care goes down as much as 60 to 80 percent. Uh, this is the front uh, uh, front area of my office, and that's my s staff. Two of them are full time; the rest are all part time. And you can see we're a happy family. Uh, hardly any medical offices these days look that happy. We have that f much fun all the time. On the lower left there is my uh, office manager, Amy Jackson, and um, on the lower right is my full time back office assistant, Jennifer. And the rest are all part-time, do various minor things. But I usually have about three people in the office. This is the waiting room, the non-waiting room, typical exam room. That happens to be my wife um, taking a blood pressure of my, uh, on my uh, IT guy. That's Amy. That's Jennifer. That's the gal that does my accounting, a couple other people. Um, the practice was launched in 2006, 500-plus uh, patients. Um, uh, it's capped at 600. I have about scholarship patients, about 100 patients that don't pay anything. The fee is $1,800 a year, um, and we do all these things for the patients. Starting one's not for the inexperienced in most cases. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. I think I worked harder the year I set up this concierge practice than I did as an intern at County USC Medical Center. These are some numbers that I, um, uh, I uh, websites that I put out. SIMPTI, I'm going to talk about a little later. MDVIP is a, uh, a large national organization that uh, runs about 230 practices as a franchise organization. They're worth talking to if you want to do a concierge practice. Spe Special Docs is a consultant in Chicago that I use to help start mine. You can do it yourself with help from SIMPTI, believe me, a lot of people have, hundreds and hundreds of people have. Uh, primary care is in crisis. Uh, we're at grave rips risk of collapse due to the dysfunctional financial uh, delivery system. Immediate and comprehensive reforms are required to replace, the to, to replace systems that undermine and undervalue the relationship between patients and their physicians. 
personal physicians, and that's from the American College of Physicians in 06, the impending collapse of primary care. You may have read that there are only 2 percent of the, this year's class went into primary care last year. I think it was 7 or 8 percent. Uh, there are no medical students that want to do what we do because we're so undervalued. Insurance companies, I won't go into all this, they're the 800-pound gorilla causing the problems. Uh, Medicare cuts and cuts and cuts, you all know this. Uh, hospitals have a damaging role, and I won't again go into that in very much detail either. Um, uh, uh, but there are disincentives uh, all over the place to, to, uh, to, to having good primary care in the uh, conventional model, where people are turning a crank trying to get CPT codes through their office. Uh, you heard of about, uh, the, an earlier speaker today was talking about how to maximize your profits in an insurance-driven system, and I think you all know how difficult that is. Errors increase, patient power declines. Um, these are the lines of financial force. You've seen these kind of slides before where actually the patient and the doctor have no financial relationship. It's all between employers and insurance companies. Um, the consumer-driven design where the patient has a direct relationship with his, his patient is here, uh, and that's what we need to move to, as you know. Um, <clears throat> physicians work, or, work and are paid, for by, paid by their patients. Uh, physicians compete for patients based on uh, the perceived benefit to the patient, not because of some insurance company's benefits. Um, patients vote with their money and go someplace else if you don't do a good job, and I can certainly live with that approach. And I'll go into some other models in the next section here. Uh, these are some people that I admire greatly, and you know some of them, uh, uh, different kinds of medical practices. Um, and uh, there are also cash specialty practices. I really enjoy John Moreland in Santa Monica, who uh, has never signed an insurance contract with anybody. Uh, and resigned from Medicare in 2003 and continues to do four or five hundred total hips and knees a year for cash. He's an incredible guy. Yeah, I don't think he belongs to apps, but he should. I've invited him to join. Um, a lot of people who are doing this type of thing are just non-joiners. Um, uh, the advantages of concierge practice, it gives you a stable income stream. By the way, the money comes in at the beginning of the year when you're usually broke. Uh, now at the beginning of the year, uh, I'm not broke. Um, there's smaller numbers of patients. You have a lot more time with each patient, a lot more increased practice satisfaction. There's less night call because you know you only have six. I only have 600 patients, and although I'm available 24/7, 365 to them, and never sign out. I even went to Greece this summer, and sailed for a week through the Greek islands with an international cell phone. And a, and a satellite phone, and I only got four calls you know, in actually two weeks, four calls. I checked in once a day. Uh, these patients are, uh, and I took care of each of those calls in less, less than five minutes. These patients are well cared for, so they don't need to call you after hours very often. Um, and even, people say, how can you be on call 24-7, 365? Well, you're on call to your kids 24-7, 365, aren't you? All right. <laughs> And you're not uh, upset about that. Um, comprehensive annual medical exams are given to each patient, and you know, all their shots are brought up to date. Every possible preventive issue you can get, you know, they get vitamin D levels. Isn't that a novel idea? And treat them with vitamin D when they're low. Same day service if they're ill, uh, immediate access 24-7 to the, to the doctor. I get upset when my patients do something else other than call me. You know, they come in on Monday and say they went to the immediate medical care center for their cut, and I say, what'd you do that for? Well, it was 3 in the morning. Well, call me. I'll go down to the office and sew it up for you. Um, long, unhurried visits, peace of mind. The children of senior citizens love concierge practice, and I do geriatrics. Um, saves hospital time. I, I, when I wrote this slide, I thought it was about 30% reduction in hospital time. Turns out it's 60 to 80% reduction in hospital time. Fewer ER visits, um, preserves experienced doctors in, in practice. My alternative to doing this kind of practice would be to retire. Gives hope to medical students and residents. As you know, that none of them go into primary care, but I gave a talk at USC a couple months ago to the medical students, first and second year medical students, and they were excited about primary care. Now, gosh, you can actually make as much as an interventional radiologist and have a decent practice in primary care? Yes, you can. There are, a lot of, there are some legal risks, but they're lessened, and I'm not going to go into them in great detail here. In California, there's the Knox Keene Act. You become an insurance company if you uh, offer uh, care to patients for an annual fee. 
So you have to get around that somehow, but it's easy. Um, again, these are websites that uh, you might want to go to if you're interested in getting help with uh, um, concierge medicine. And uh, that's, that's my airplane, the wing of my airplane. I flew over here this morning. That, that's, ha that's probably San Bernardino someplace, flying out of Big Bear not long ago. Um, yeah, then you go immediately to, uh, uh, from that snow up there to swimming in Redondo, in Redondo Beach where I live. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, Arizona's kind of hot and sunny, but California's heaven. Give me the other website, uh, the other uh, PowerPoint. This is the one I was going to give, and I'm going to give. Um, and Marcy was going to do a presentation on her pr practice, which is called uh, Choice Care in Los Alamitos. But I want to talk about SIMTI. I am the president of the Society for Innovative Medical Practice Design. Um, and by the way, Dr. Uh, Knope is on the board of directors. Um, um, and uh, what is SIMTI? Well, we're a professional association of uh, uh, direct practice doctors, doctors that work directly for patients uh, only. We provide extensive service to our member doctors uh, and, and a lot of benefits, for example, um, uh, we can arrange discount malpractice insurance. Uh, it turns out that concierge doctors literally never get sued. We cannot find a concierge doctor practice in the United States that's ever had a lawsuit filed against it, so we've arranged with uh, an insurance carrier that we made a contract with to give up to 55% discounts for malpractice insurance to concierge doctors. And we have a lot of other member be benefits, blogs and forums and discounts on various things and am air ambulance services and all kinds of things. Our next annual meeting is uh, May 7th through 9th in San Diego at the Marriott Hotel on the Bay. I hope you'll uh, uh, go to the website at uh, simpty.org and sign up and come to that meeting. It'll be a great meeting. By the way, we're going to be next week at the AFP meeting in San Diego uh, at, where we'll have a booth and we'll be um, trying to track some of those 5,000 AFP doctors who are frustrated and despondent and disillusioned to uh, change their way, mode of practice. Um, what is a direct practice doctor? Well, most are concierge doctors, but some are, uh, are PIP doctors who took take only cash for care. Some are subspecialists, doc like Dr. Moreland I mentioned a while ago, who do cash practices. Um, all have financial relationships with their patients uh, outside or beyond or completely excluding uh, insurance companies. Um, concierge practice, uh, there are several types. The basic idea is to limit your practice to a small number of patients, anywhere from four to 800 patients, uh, and provide these patients with unparalleled service uh, in, a, in a, an unparalleled pleasant environment um, for a directly contracted fee. Gee, isn't that unusual? Um, what, what different kinds of practices are there? Well, first there's the fee-for-care design. Fee-for-care design is one like Dr. Knope runs. It, there's an annual fee and everything that you could possibly do in a primary care office is paid for by that fee. And the patient never gets another charge. That particular design is a problem in California because of the knox keene Act and you can't do it there. Uh, but in many areas it's a very excellent design. Um, these, uh, they may, some doctors may have some minor charges for things like vaccines and uh, uh, expensive things in the office, but uh, many of them just don't charge anything. It's just a single flat fee. And they, those fees can vary from anywhere from $1,500 uh, a year to as high as $10,000 a year. Um, um, there's a fee-for-care design practice in Seattle called q Lions, run by Garrison Bliss, a former president of this organization, uh, that charges an average of about $50 or $60 a month for, for fee-for-care practice. And that model is one that could be generalized to everybody in the United States. We think the vast majority of Americans could have their primary care through this kind of a setting and bypass the insurance companies and save a lot of money. Are there other kinds of practices? Yes, there's a fee for non-covered service practices. This is the design that MDVIP popularized. It happens to be the same design as mine. It works in California because of the knox Keene Act. These doctors, about 80% of their income is an annual fee, but they also charge fees for office visits too. Uh, that gets around the laws in, in California uh, so that I'm not an insurance company. The fee pays for an annual comprehensive exam, wellness exam, 
um, and a follow-up on that and a wellness plan, which is outlined in great detail and followed up on in great detail. Um, and it pays for access to the practice where uh, there's never any waiting and you get same day or next day uh, visits and 30-minute visits and, and leisurely visits in a non-waiting room and all that sort of stuff. Um, but they do charge for, 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 for other covered medical services. And this does allow you to stay in Medicare because this is allowable under Medicare. In a fee-for-care design, you got to opt out of Medicare because you cannot charge, you cannot be participating in Medicare when you charge Medicare patients for their covered fees. And perhaps Dr. Knope can mention that. Um, there's still other kinds of practices. There's cash at time of service practices. Uh, that provide the same uh, um, limited patient panel care, personalized, easy access, and so on, but they actually charge the patient at time of service for each, each fee. They still limit their practice to 600, say. They have a reasonable fee. It's cash. Uh, uh, they have a, a fixed panel of patients. Uh, they usually opt out of Medicare and often out of other insurance plans, and, and there are also hybrids, people that mix these kinds of things. Um, then there's urgent care practices. You saw on an earlier slide on the previous presentation, Dr. Robert S. Berry in Tennessee. Uh, he, he's a member of APPS. I think uh, he's spoken here. Um, he's a member of SIMPTI um, also. And uh, uh, he runs a cash urgent care practice. He's an emergency room doctor. And you, you know him. He's been on 2020 and testified in, the, in Congress. Uh, that kind of practice is uh, also part of our auspices. How can you start a concierge practice or a direct care practice? Well, in my humble opinion, the first step is to go to the website, simpty.org, and join the organization. It only costs $500 a year, and we have tons of uh, uh, assistance for you, PowerPoint presentations and educational materials and discounts on malpractice once you're established and, um, you know, access to our board of directors and our lawyers. Uh, uh, for advice, and, and, and one of our board of directors uh, is uh, Dave Hilgers of Texas, who's a, a medical attorney, and he's very free with his, with his, with his advice. You can also retain him. Uh, but the first step for many of us was joining SIMPTI. Uh, it was one of my early steps. I went to my first meeting in Texas, uh, and uh, I was absolutely inspired by the doctors I met. People who were happy, people who were enjoying their practices, people who were fulfilled, people who were making a good living. Um, once you go to one of those meetings, you can't turn back. Um, how do you go about joining SIMPTI? Click on the website. Uh, go to the member services section. Actually, now we changed the website. It says a button on the right-hand top corner that says Join SIMPTI. Big pink button. Push there. So this is out of date. Um, why should I join SIMPTI? First, we can provide you with step-by-step -step educational instructions. We can lead you to consultants and legal advice. I think I already mentioned this. After you join SIMPTI, why do you want to stay in SIMPTI? Well, per one, we have a physician, find a physician section on the website, which is marketed and advertised. It brings patients to you, many, many patients. Some of my members have told me that they get a patient every month or two from the SIMPTI website. Now the website is getting even more visible than it was before, and we're, we just committed, the board just committed $1,000 a month to advertising the website to bring eyes to that website. So the number of patients that this site will bring you if you're in the final a physician section will skyrocket as soon as we can get that money into it, which is soon. Are there laws governing the problem? Uh, are, are the laws governing the direct practice the same in all states? No, they're not. I mentioned that in California we have the Knox Keen Act, and you can't do a direct, uh, you can't do a fee for care practice like Steve does. In Washington State, you, 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 you essentially can't do what I do. Their laws are just the opposite. They favor fee for care laws care practices. They're not absolute. What I do isn't illegal up there, but it's frowned upon. You have to check with your own state. You have to get good uh, legal advice in your own state in addition to the general advice. Uh, the federal government has acted on this. Uh, when Tommy Thompson was, uh, was chief of CMS, he investigated uh, concierge medicine. And he says he, he wrote a letter and made it, made it put out a position which hasn't been stated, uh, changed, that it's perfectly okay as long as uh, to be a member of Medicare as long as you're charging for non-Medicare covered services. If you are charging for Medicare covered services, you have to opt out of Medicare, which apps would prefer you did anyway, right? Um, why should patients join these practices? Well, the frustration of patients with their care 
in the, in the system right now is palpable. It's horrible. Patients are uh, numbers. They're, they're waiting an hour and a half to be seen. They're seen for seven minutes. Their doctor no longer goes to the hospital. He, ha he sends them to a, a, a hospitalist who doesn't know them. Um, after hours, uh, you call the doctor and he just says, go to the emergency room. Family doctors are hard to find and in general internists are, are far, hard to find anymore. And when you find when you don't get very good care. Patients come to me and sign into my practice and major errors have been made. I just picked up a patient where the physician missed a uh, multiple myeloma uh, tumor in his uh, thoracic spine at T3 and he was paralyzed by the time he uh, was diagnosed by his urologist. Uh, excellent internist in our community who sees patients on a treadmill turning the CPT code crank. crank. I couldn't believe that came out of his office. But as he got weaker and weaker and his wife started pushing him into the wheel, in a wheelchair into the office for complaints about chest pain, and he finally said, I don't know what's wrong with you. I've done every test I can imagine. I can't find out what's, what, what's wrong with your chest pain. You'll just have to live with it. And then he called his urologist, who sent him to a neurologist, who diagnosed his cord lesion. That's what's happening out there. And this was a doctor I greatly have respected over the years. What services can patients expect in concierge practice? Well, comprehensive annual exams, as I mentioned, wellness and fitness outlines. Steve has a gym in his office. When he finishes seeing patients each round of thing, he goes into the gym and teaches them how to exercise. It's a great plan. Um, 24 uh, 7, 365 cell phone access to the doctor, same day leisurely time appointments, courteous treatment by the staff, amenities, coffee. I have well, gourmet coffee. and My staff wants to put in a martini bar right in the middle up front. I've vetoed that. Empty non-waiting room for family members, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the uh, Investor's Business Daily, the LA Times the, the, is out there for people to read, but they stay and read after their appointments, or the family does it. Home visits when they're needed. These are other things that uh, are often provided in, in concierge practice. Internet access and prompt daily responses. I answer my emails every day. Um, prescription facilitation, uh, medication reviews, uh, these are just items that are, that are pretty routine. Lab drawing in the office, you don't have to go someplace else. Uh, specialty care coordination. In the more expensive concierge practices, quite often the doctor attends consultations with the patient. So if he sends him to a cardiologist, he'll actually attend the consultation or even sit in the operating room and watch the surgeon make sure he doesn't screw up. <laughs> How fast is this? <laughs> Sorry, if there are any of you surgeons out there, I know you never screw up. Uh, how fast is this movement growing? Well, in 1996 or so, there were zero concierge practices. The first one was started in Seattle. Uh, right down the hall from that, the second one started. Um, one of our board members started a, a, a third one in 1997 in San Francisco. Um, Steve started his in 2000. At that point, there were a couple of hundred. I started mine in 2005. At that point, there were maybe 400. Today, there are estimated five to 10,000 concierge practices in the United States, and it's exponentially exploding. Whereas when I started, there were zero in my community. There are now four. Another one's going online this uh, summer, or this uh, fall. Um, this movement is growing exponentially because primary care out there has uh, been devalued and, and is deteriorated to the point of almost uh, non-existence. Um, how big is the ultimate market for this? It's unlimited. We believe that the majority of Americans will ultimately be in these kinds of practices because they're affordable, they cost less than cigarettes, and then we can teach you to stop them. Uh, yeah, I mean, they cost less than your cell phone in q in Seattle. Uh, uh, is, uh, that program, is, is that inexpensive? We should, we, this should be aimed at everybody. Um, so unless there's some unforeseen barrier to the expansion of these types of practices, such as the government taking over health care in its entirety and, and, and outlawing what we do, uh, this is just going to continue to expand. Um, HSAs and FSAs and HRAs can be used in these practices, although there's some uh, uh, issues about that, which I won't go into in great detail. Um, so that's the end of, uh, of my my 30 minutes, and I'm going to turn this over to Steve, who uh, will tell you about a lot of other stuff. Thanks. You, you can tell Tom doesn't really care very much about this movement. Um, he sort of, I don't know where he gets all the hours in the day to do this, but I get emails at 2, 3 in the morning from him. Um, 
let me just ask so I understand who I'm speaking with. How many people are primary care physicians? Oh, a large number. And how many are surgeons? Good. Any mal malpractice attorneys? No? Okay. Insurance agents? Good. Okay, so we can be honest. Um, as Tom said, I started one of the first practices in the country uh, in, in 2000 now, eight years ago. And uh, on, the, on the front page of the Arizona Daily Star was a quote from one of the university professors which read, this is boutique medicine at its mercenary worst. Okay. Um, I just wrote the first book on the subject, published in May, and the, the first uh, endorsement is from Dave Alberts, president or the, uh, the uh, director of the Arizona Cancer Center who says Canope has the answer to our healthcare crisis. So we've come a long way in, in a short period of time from you are greedy bastards to, oh, maybe the status quo is not so ethical after, after all, um, in which doctors contract with third party payers agreeing to limit and ration care for the profits of insurance giants or, or the Medicare system and, uh, and, and screw patients and doctors in the meantime. So I think we've made a huge amount of, pro uh, of progress here in, in the last several years. Um, how many of you have any interest, you primary care doctors, even a fleeting interest in Two of you, three of you, four of you, five. So, oh, good. Well, oh, yes. Now they're all coming out of the woodwork. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Uh, how many? How many have any interest in concierge medicine at all, or even exploring that idea? Okay, great. Um, I, I brought some books, which you know, if, if you want me to, to sign them, I'll be happy to do that afterwards. But we'll have some books in, you know, to, to hawk the book. That's my that's my um, my disclosure here. But if anyone is interested, it is the only book out there, and I'll give you a, a, an overview of, of what this means. I'd like to tell you about a really liberating experience. And, and Jane knows me pretty well. We've we've sort of been battling insurance companies and HMOs for the past um, ten years or so, and I've been on the covered the Arizona Daily Star eight times for, for my activities. Never been in jail, but close to it, um, fighting the HMOs. And um, recently, um, I had a, a really nice exchange with Blue Cross Blue Shield, which I'd like to share with you um, to tell you why I like this movement so much. Um, I have a mixed practice, meaning that um, most of my patients and almost all of my income comes from my retainer practice. Patients pay me an annual fee. However, I see a, a fair number of patients, probably 10% of my patients, um, like Tom does, gratis, free of charge at my selection. People that I know need my care and services, not the US government or anyone else. And those people get free care. But I've also kept, oh, 100 or so Blue Cross Blue Shield patients on, accepting their, their fine reimbursement, which you know about. I think I probably get about 22 cents on the dollar. So I've had a relationship with Blue Cross for 15 years, whereby I do not bill them for my concierge patients. And I accept their crappy rates for the people that cannot afford my program just to kind of keep them on the rules so they won't have to find a new doctor. So a month ago, I was asked by the Arizona Republic to comment on a story on concierge medicine. And uh, 10 days ago, I was called by Blue Cross, and they spoke with my receptionist and said, does Dr. Canope practice concierge medicine? No, it's just, as a matter of fact, he does. Yes, we just read his quote in the uh, Arizona Republic. Tell him he'll be terminated. We'll be sending him written termination of his contract. Yes. Yes, exactly. I was, I was, you can imagine how heartbroken I was. <laughs> so bypassing the normal channels and, and, and really kind of savoring the moment, I called their director of public relations, Carlos somebody, and I said, Carlos, how you doing? Dr. Knope, I understand you've just terminated me. Um, how would you like the press release to read? He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, first of all, this is not going to impact me financially at all. In fact, I've been saving your company thousands of dollars every year by not billing you for your concierge patients. Second, yeah, millions. So <laughs> Second of all, it's not going to affect my concierge patients in the least because they've been seeing me out of network anyhow. So it's not going to hurt them. It's not going to hurt me. The, the people that you're screwing are, frankly, the 100 people that I've kept in my practice accepting your lousy rates so they don't have to find a new doctor. And, and I'd just like to know what your, your explanation is for this. So he said, um, let me get back to you. So about two hours later, I was called by the director of provider relations who said, um, you know, this is unacceptable. And I said, well, that's interesting. Three years ago, you told me it was just fine with you, and now it's not. Um, but, you know, whatever, fine. Uh, send me my termination letter. How do you want the press release to read? 
uh, we'll have to get back to our lawyers. And I go, good, good. You've got lawyers, I'm sure. You've got lawyers, you've got a press department. Just how do you want it to read so I don't misquote you? And, 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 and so I knew that the, the thing was being taped, and so I sort of embellished and had a lot of fun with them. So I called the Republic and I said, you know, here's the story. And they said, oh, how interesting. Let's run a follow-up story, which they did this week. And, uh, you know, everyone saw right, right, right through the nonsense. And in Blue Cross, in, in their defense, what they're saying now is that they're considering this. They're reconsidering this because they don't have a policy on concierge medicine. But it, it would appear after my conversation with them that they're trying to quickly formulate one. And what they said was that um, really their greatest concern was they want to protect their members. And I said, uh, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because the people who pay me every year, um, you know, a retainer fee are probably not capable of figuring out whether or not it's worth their money to engage in a direct relationship. So it's good you're there to protect them from their doctor. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the beauty of the story, the beauty of the story is not that this is another insurance company behaving badly. That's not new news, right? The beauty is it just doesn't matter. And so, you know, when, when you look at this situation and you say not only is this a middleman, but really it's, it's really a mafioso situation where you have, uh, you know, a, a third party that adds nothing to the interaction between the doctor and the patient, right? They, they offer nothing. Um, they don't facilitate anything that the patient can't get directly from us. They take from the patient, they take from us, and the beauty is that once you realize that and once you remove the element of fear, the game is over. There, there is, you know, there is nothing else to fear because Blue Cross Blue Shield and all the other third-party payers cannot practice medicine. They are not licensed to practice medicine. The only way their business model works is if they have primary care. So I am encouraging them to piss off as many primary care doctors as they can so that they don't have a roster to sell their lousy product. Okay, so, you know, look, life is short. Uh, time is ticking. None of us are, are, you know, 30 years old, just out of medical school now. I would encourage you all to seriously consider this move. Um, it's a little scary. Um, I think SIMPD does, you know, offer some some good support as a nonprofit organization. You can join a group like MDVIP, but you will pay them a million dollars over over three years to convert your practice. And from my perspective, that is no better than than joining, uh, you know, a, a third party payer because because um, these guys really are feeding off the physician's fear and the physician's lack of business knowledge. And let me tell you, the business knowledge that it takes to run you know, a concierge practice, you could put in a thimble. You set your rates. Your patients decide whether or not to pay that rate. They give you a check. You take it to the bank. You pay your overhead. You're done, okay? <laughs> because once you get rid of all this layering and this, I don't, I couldn't tell you the first thing about CPT codes now. I don't know any of them. I could care less. Um, so once you remove all the layers and the denials and the EOBs and everything, and you strip this down, I have one employee. I have a very nice office. I take my own vital signs in the back room. It gives me more time to talk to my patients. I draw my own blood. I've got plenty of time to do all that stuff. I've got a stripped down, lean, mean machine that makes me a lot of money, that makes my patients very, very happy. And, and, and there are no losers. So I would strongly encourage any of you, and I'm, at this point I'm just going to open up to questions to the both, both of us, I would strongly encourage you to consider taking back the practice of medicine. Because once you get rid of that third party mo model, you'd be amazed at how much fun you have with medicine. Medicine has never been the problem. It's the practice of medicine and, and all the bureaucratic nonsense that has made it unfun. Thanks. That's, that's, a, that's the only speech you're going to get. And I'll answer all the questions you want along with Tom. Would this work for other specialties? And do you have a mentoring model so that a resident can come and moonlight with you? You know, I think it, it, it does work for other models, um, and, and a lot of specialists have come to me um, and, and, and said, you know, really the question they're asking is, can, can we do fee-for-service medicine? And Tom gave a great example of the orthopedic surgeon. Of course you can. Um, the question of mentoring model, this is, this is something that you can't do right out of school because you've really got to have a, a reputation in the community, you've got to have a patient base. So uh, there are concierge doctors who are looking for uh, young people to, to bring into their practice uh, and, and, and that's really the only way I think to do it for somebody right out of training. 
Well, SIMPTE has a classified ad section that members can put classified ads in. There's a practice in Florida right now that just put a classified ad up looking for a new doctor to join its five doctor concierge practice. They need six. Uh, it, it's grown that much. Um, you know, many of us would love to have a young partner, a young associate, and, and teach them the ropes. I keep looking for one. Uh, in my community, an endocrinologist just is in the process right now of converting her practice to concierge. Um, she, what her, her, her idea is that she wants all of her diabetic patients in the concierge practice. And then she'll do endocrinology consults on the side um, in a fee for non-covered service model, her patients will be, and then she'll do endocrine consults on the side, still using the uh, insurance system and Medicare for just one-time consults. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a very successful practice. She's a super endocrinologist. She's only about 45. Uh, she's been in practice uh, 10 years. Uh, she is in intensely respected in our community, and this is going to be a wildly successful practice. An infectious disease specialist in my community, an ID guy, um, who happens to be chief of staff of the local hospital that I'm at right now, is talking to me very intensely about converting his practice. And again, same kind of model. He wants to do primary care uh, for a few hundred patients and then do IED consults in the hospital on the side. Yeah, there's all kinds of permutations that you can do this with. You got Dr. Bihar's, uh, Mr. Bihar's attention when you said game over, so I'm sure he has. Well, <laughs> here, here's something I don't know if you considered. Um, you're helping yourselves. You're taking doctor capacity out of the insured market. So do you also help doctors in the area that are currently uh, captured by the insurance people too? You're taking doctor capacity out. You're helping yourself. You're also helping doctors that are stuck in the market with insurers. You are no longer going to be a Blue Cross person, right? Correct. You mean am I, am I burdening them? No. Oh, helping. I'm helping them. You are helping other doctors in the area because the insurers have fewer doctors to go to now. Right. So not only are you helping yourself, you're helping other doctors in the area also that are stuck with insurance, let's say. You mean they, they might have a better negotiating power. Yes. The, those doctors might have a better position to negotiate. Quite true. The other thing that happened in my practice, I spun off several thousand patients who did not want to join my practice. And I, I chose, and you mu when you do this, you must provide for those patients. You must. That's ethically uh, mandatory. I identified five physicians in my community that were willing to take new patients, and I tried to transfer each one of those patients very carefully and, and ju judiciously to one of those practices. And even to this day, if someone calls my office, as happened just the day before yesterday, who never responded to my lever letter, never opted out of my practice, never found a new doctor, and hadn't been sick for four years, and called with a, with a cough and said, you're doing what? We see them, take care of them, deal with their medical problem, and the minutes it's over, then you gotta say, well look, you got a choice. You can go on the waiting list for my practice, which is pretty short right now, um, or you can go to one of these other five doctors who will take, uh, uh, take you on as a, as a new patient, then we can transfer your records there, but what you can't do is what you just did anymore, because this is the last time we're gonna do that. But, but you're helping everybody is what I'm getting at. You're giving other doctors a better negotiating position as well. And the more people do this, the better that gets. Thanks. What was the bad news you're going to tell us? The bad news is we're screwed because um, I was just in Washington, D.C. And if, if you think insurance companies are corrupt, try talking to politicians. Um, the JAMA article had just been published about the fact that the class of 2000 you know, has a whopping 2% of its members going into internal medicine. Um, it was very clear to me that the, the congressman and the people in that room thought, what a great tragedy. I've got money. I can buy whatever I want. Um, you know, Washington is all about individuals in Washington, uh, and, and, and I would not look to them to save us. I would not look for any politician, any new law. None of that's going to save us. The bottom line is it's a very simple concept. You know, one of, one of my colleagues said to me, if you, if you own a rock quarry and, and, and you're the only one who can, you know, who can cut granite in the town, you've kind of got a lock on the market. And what physicians have not understood is that there is a small number of doctors in every community. They can't be shipped in any more easily than, than granite can. And, and, and so, 
trust me, the only thing that is holding everybody to these third party payers is fear that something's going to happen to them. You know, it's that old, you remember the, the elephant and the banyan tree analogy? Have you heard that? If you take an elephant and you tie his leg to a banyan tree, which has this amazing root system, the elephant will tug at it for about three days until he realizes that he can't get free. From that point forward, all you have to do is take the rope, put a little stake in the ground, and tap it down there, and the elephant won't try to move. As soon as he feels that little tug, then he's stuck. He's stuck. Even though he could pull it away, he's still a slave. And that is exactly what's happened to us. There's no value added by the third parties. There's no value added, and there's nothing that they can do that you can't do on your own. And the only thing that's holding you there is a fear that something bad's going to happen to you. And you know, the only reason I do these talks, my practice is going well, Tom's practice is going well, the only reason we do these talks is to try to infuse a little bit of courage and a little bit of, of, of chutzpah into people and say, look, you can, <laughs> look, we're still standing, see us, you know? We're still standing, Blue Cross throws knives and all these people throw knives. We're, we're doing just fine and you'll do just fine too. Just take the plunge and do it. We've heard a lot about peer review abuse. Do you see an opportunity here to set the standard by saying we'll be happy to undergo peer review with due process and independent adjudication, one of the four elements of due process as defined by the Supreme Court? Second question would be the uh, fact that you mentioned cost shifting, that you have a significant number of patients whom you charge very little or nothing somewhat like the doctors in Asheville, North Carolina, who spread the, the uh, burden of the uninsured roughly equitably. Isn't that a standard? And in fact, could you accept indirectly payments from charitable organizations in your community, even the forbidden religious organizations, to help pay your, your uh, fees? Um, uh Regarding payment from other third parties to us for our practices, no, it's, I mean, couldn't a patient take money from a church and say the I'm patient can take money sure. from anyone they want to pay us? Sure. But I, in my practice, I'll never accept a check from any third party. It's got to come from the patient specifically. Insofar as peer review, Simpty has not looked into peer review at all. Um, and as 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 the president of that organization, I I don't have a comment. I think I think uh, Apps has done a wonderful job of looking into peer review. Uh, you guys are, are quite on the forefront of that. Jane. I wouldn't worry too much about threat letters from Blue Cross, but have any of your members received threat letters from CMS, especially if they've not opted out of Medicare, or perhaps just threats from politicians that they would like to outlaw this practice, and what, what you think the chances are of that? Um, well, the reason I don't, I'll let Tom comment on that. Um, yeah, CMS, you know, I opted out four years ago, and it's interesting, you know, you've got, not only do you have this little window, you have to opt out, and then, you know, you've got a couple weeks or a couple months before every little quarter, but then every two years you have to go, yep, sending you the same form letter, still not interested, still unhappy. Um, don't want CMS, don't want Medicare. So as long as you play that game, I think, I think that's, um, that's, that's fine. What's your... Well, you know, it's, it turns out that the majority of concierge doctors have not opted out of Medicare. Tommy Thompson wrote a letter or an opinion when he was CMS secretary that was perfectly all right to be in Medicare as long as you didn't charge for a Medicare covered service, and you have to be very careful not to do that. People have done that and have gotten in trouble. There was a guy, was it in Wisconsin, right. um, who was charging for Medicare covered services and had not to opted out of Medicare, and he was clearly violating the law and hadn't gotten good advice, and they came down on him hard. In the end, he just modified his practice design, and nothing bad happened to him, um, but he went through hell for a, for a while. Yeah, and the part two question is an interesting one. You know, do, w w what about the day that, you know, after Barack's, you know, our president, and they come and say that we have, you know, nationalized health care, what happens to this business model? Let me share a little story with you. I have a, a, a staunch Hillary supporter in my practice, and um, we still talk, and uh, she came into my office, <laughs> and I said, let me get this straight. You support Hillary. You're on a first-name basis. You flaunt that. That's really cool and everything. You know I can't stand her. That's okay. But why are you paying me? as opposed to availing yourself of, of a nationalized healthcare service. And she said, are you kidding? I never trust my healthcare with that. So, you know, <laughs> if, 
if that was, I mean, I have so many limousine liberals in my practice. And so here's my great cynical confidence. It doesn't come from, you know, any noble intentions. It's that, that even the liberals understand that, that if any nationalized health care system goes through, it will have to be similar to Great Britain, where we will have some preservation of free market care. Because, you know, the liberal, look, you know, and, and I say this with, with no bad or ill intent toward Senator Kennedy, but, you know, he has said for years that, that all Americans deserve, you know, the best health care and what, what a state senator gets. So, you know, my question always, of course, to an audience is, well, you know, who's going to pay for that? But I mean, we can't afford to fly everyone from their vacation home to the Mass General when the surgeon there is not good enough, then ship them off to Duke because there's a better neurosurgeon there and, and, and pretend this game that it's all free and we're all going to be able to pay for it. And, and, and even the liberals understand that. So I'm not worried at this moment that, that, that the government is going to try to create a Canadian system because the liberals won't tolerate it. Let me tell you something else. I, I happen to know that a Chicago primary care doctor uh, who takes care of the Obama family is in the process right now of converting his practice to concierge. <laughs> That's a fact. Um, one of our uh, board members uh, from San Francisco, Dr. Schlein, uh, is from a very liberal community, San Francisco, as you might imagine. He takes care of a senator. He takes care of a congressperson whose name you would immediately recognize. Um, he takes care of a mayor, or a former mayor. Um, all of these people want his services, okay? And they don't want a system that, pre that excludes them, or prevents them from getting their, their care. If we had, let's say we had Medicare for everyone in the United States, let's say we had that. That wouldn't change what we do at all. Because unless they do what the Canadians tried to do and failed to do, and now it's legal to practice medicine privately in Canada, at least that's according to the Supreme Court of Canada, as you all know. Um, unless they do what the Canadians did, which is not going to happen in the United States no matter what, there will always be a market for primary care uh, in a direct relationship with your doctor. Even if you happen to be an unfortunate neurosurgeon and have to take the government's uh, money for your brain surgery, primary care will uh, will 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 be uh, uh, doable in this fashion, and ultimately neurosurgery will too. Okay. Thank you very much.